Good morning. morning. And good afternoon or good evening to those of you watching online as well. Uh, As was introduced, I am Andrew Lund, my wife Denise and I, we moved to Mesa about a couple of years ago and we joined Victory and now I am a member, a new member of council. Um, My career, I am an automotive chief engineer and a lifelong believer in Jesus. And and that will come into play a little bit here as I talk. I'm also a missionary kid and I grew up in Japan. So maybe the question you're asking is, why am I preaching? I'm not Pastor Steve, but don't worry. You know, it won't be that bad and we do need to give him a a, a rest. (laughs) I'm also not an ordained pastor. Uh, But I did say I I am a missionary kid, and strangely enough, in some circles, that holds credibility. For example, I experienced many times when we would gather for a meal, and, you know, the crowd looks around, okay, who's going to pray? Is there a pastor in the house? Nope, no pastor in the house. Oh, well, there's a missionary kid. He must know how to pray. We'll ask him. Of course, being the son of a pastor doesn't necessarily mean that you're qualified or credible. Um, It doesn't always work that way, does it? But my real credibility does not rest in me at all, nor in my earthly father, but rather in my heavenly father and in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit who has called and abides in us. I really take no credit in my own spiritual journey. So then again, let me ask the question, why am I preaching today? Well, I just said yes when Pastor Steve asked me to preach. And I also trusted that God would provide. And then I woke up the next morning and I said, what did I get myself into? (laughs) So let us look at today's reading. Today's reading is about Nicodemus' meeting Jesus, another of the encounters that we are talking about in this series. Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish ruling council That would make him the rabbi of rabbis, the teacher of teachers, a true, true scholar. And he was a Pharisee belonging to that strict Jewish sect. Nicodemus knew the scriptures, likely memorizing most, if not all, of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. And he was open-minded because he recognized the signs that Jesus were performing as coming from God. The Bible is full of other Pharisees who were much less open-minded, and they ridiculed Jesus, but not Nicodemus. He noticed the signs. And I believe Jesus recognized Nicodemus' knowledge, and so in this passage, he gives the full and concise gospel. There are no parables. There are no hidden secrets. He gives it all out. He lays it all out. The direct truth. And then John summarizes all that is said in that perhaps most recognized iconic Bible verse, John 3.16. You know, the one that people hold up in stadiums sometimes. Uh, You might have seen them. But it's really powerful, and we'll unpack that. So then listen now to today's gospel reading from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a a second time in their mother's womb. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, 
But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who comes from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man, Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, holy is your name. I pray your Holy Spirit abides in us today and may you guide my words. All glory and honor are yours. In your name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. This scripture is so rich. It's so full of wisdom. It really could take weeks to unpack it and give it true justice. But don't worry, I won't keep you that long. Now, my first reaction to this scripture, I felt very critical of Nicodemus. After all, he was the teacher of teachers, right? The rabbi of rabbis. If ever there was a person who should have told the story of Jesus, it should have been Nicodemus, or so I thought. But the New Testament is instead written by Jesus' disciples, who were fishermen, businessmen, a tax collector, not your group of highly trained rabbi. And by Paul, who was persecuting the early Christians. Paul wrote about one-fourth of the New Testament. Nicodemus, he wrote none. But upon further prayer and reflection, I came to believe that my initial reaction was not from God at all. Rather, I realized it was my own worldview. You see, I am an engineer. I have spent my whole career finding and solving complex problems. It's what engineers do. But I have found that this mentality of mine can trip me up. You just ask my wife, Denise. I have learned that not every problem that is described to me needs to be fixed by me. All you wives, you can nudge your husband now. Sometimes what is needed is to simply listen, empathize, and stand in someone else's shoes. So, after prayer and meditation, I realized what Jesus really wanted me to say. This scripture reading is not about what could have happened. The story of Jesus does not need to be fixed by me or by anybody. It is already perfect. The story just needs to be told as it is. So then let us look at what is indeed contained in today's scripture. There are only a few verses in the Bible about Nicodemus, but they do show that Nicodemus was truly impacted by Jesus. In this verse we just read, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he recognizes the signs, and as a result, we have this very rich conversation between the two. This conversation which impacted John, who was either in the room listening or maybe outside of the room as depicted in the series, The Chosen, and many millions since have been impacted by this. John mentions Nicodemus again in chapter seven. The Jewish leaders are discussing about what to do about Jesus. And Nicodemus speaks up and says, we need to let him speak. We can't judge him before we allow him to speak. He defends Jesus. That probably took courage to go against the overwhelming majority opinion. 
And then John mentions Nicodemus a third time in chapter 19. Nicodemus accompanied Joseph of Arimathea, and they took Jesus' body to the tomb. And Nicodemus, he brought 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. That probably cost a little bit. So Nicodemus was with Jesus when he started his ministry. He was with Jesus during the trial, and he was with Jesus at his burial. Yes, Jesus impacted Nicodemus when he encountered him. And this encounter of Jesus with Nicodemus impacted John powerfully. And we can say Jesus indeed impacts all of us through this story. Nicodemus's encounter with Jesus indeed lays the foundation for our own personal encounters with Jesus. And there is so much in this reading, so much wisdom, I would like to look closely at that most iconic Bible verse, John 3.16. John 3.16 has three parts, and so we'll take them one at a time. The first part is, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. One and only son? Really? I have two sons. I love them so much, I could never give them up. But God did, that's how much he loves us. So this story is a love story. And more than that, John tells us in his first letter that God is love. We can define love by God's actions, by Jesus' sacrifice, and by the Holy Spirit abiding in us. This is a deep love, a very deep love. So the next time you go to the Grand Canyon or you see a picture of it and you look down and you see how deep it is, remember that God's love is deep, very deep, so deep that he gave his one and only son for you, for me, for us. The second part is that whoever believes in him, whoever, that means this invitation is to anybody. This invitation is to everybody. It does not matter where you are from. It does not matter the color of your skin. It does not matter whether you have blonde hair, red, brown, or black hair, or very little hair like me. Whoever, everybody has this opportunity. This is a broad love. Next time you are at the ocean, or an open desert, and you look and you see the horizon just goes on forever. Please remember that God's love is broad, so broad that it includes everybody. The invitation is to everybody. The third part, shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life, for real? Yes, yes, for real. Jesus conquered death. Death cannot hold those who believe in Jesus. This is an eternal love. It does not grow old. It does not diminish or get weak. It is a sustained, eternal love. Now, as was mentioned, I grew up in Japan as a missionary kid, and I do speak Japanese. And I remember hearing the following interpretation for the word love. The character for love is going to be up on the screen here. There it is. This is, is pronounced I. And there are three parts to this character. The top part is similar to the part of the character for the kanji or the character house. And then under that roof is the character for heart, the four strokes in the middle, the little squiggly ones, that's heart. And the bottom character is derived from the Chinese character for action, and it is very similar in shape for the character for woman. So it was explained to me that the definition of love is the heart and actions of a woman in a house under a roof. I love this creative interpretation of this character. It is hard to imagine anyone loving more than a mother, right? But Jesus gives us an even better definition via John. Love is even more than humanly possible. It is from God. This changes everything. God is love. This is a deep love, a broad love, an eternal love. So, 
if the story is already perfect, does not need to be fixed, what should we do? What are we to do? We just need to tell the story. Because the light of the world has come into this world in the form of Jesus. We don't have to live in darkness anymore. We have been set free, truly set free. All we need to do is say yes to be obedient to God's call. The Bible is full of ordinary people who said yes to God. You know, for example, Abraham, Moses, David, the disciples, and Paul all said yes despite being imperfect themselves. Abraham was a wanderer. Moses was a stutterer. David was an adulterer. The disciples came from various backgrounds. Paul persecuted Christians. Yet they were all called as they were, and they followed God. Pastor Steve said yes many years ago, and look at what a blessing he has been and continues to be to victory and to the church. Pastor Todd Matheson, our new senior pastor, said yes just a few weeks ago to, be, to come to victory. And what a blessing he is and will continue to be. And there are so many volunteers here at Victory that have said yes, staff members that have said yes. And what a blessing they are. What a blessing you are. Just look at all of the ministries we have going on here at Victory. My father and mother said yes to Jesus when they were young. And they were sent off to faraway Japan as missionaries. They spent nearly 40 years there and raised four boys, and what a blessing they have been. Yet none of them, as wonderful as they are, none of them are perfect. And as I mentioned, I said yes when Pastor Steve asked me, and I said yes to Jesus when I was young. And I know, I certainly know that I am not perfect. Therefore, we don't need to wait to be perfect. We just need to come to Jesus as we are. We just need to say yes. And then, and then, expect to be impacted, to be transformed, to come into that light. So the next time Pastor Steve or Pastor Todd or other leaders in Victory Lutheran Church tap you on the shoulder or invite you to participate in ministry, say yes. I believe if you do, you will truly be blessed, just as I have been blessed in just preparing for today. And the good news is that the Holy Spirit is sent to guide us on our journey. We don't have to do this alone. The Holy Spirit is with us. But there is one caveat about saying yes. We can't blindly say yes to just everybody, everything, right? Did you see the comedy movie called Yes Man? Jim Carrey plays the role of a man who has been challenged at a, at a motivational seminar by this inspirational guru. And this guru convinces him that he needs to say yes to anything and everything that someone asks of him. Well, as you can imagine, it really becomes humorously funny and things go wrong. Um, so obviously, that makes for a funny movie, but it doesn't make for a, a good life. We can't say yes to just anything. We need to say yes to God's will. So how can we then tell when to say yes and when to say no? Well, we need a discerning heart. We need to read the Bible, often to recognize God's voice. We need to worship, pray, and study. And we need to do this also with our spiritual brothers and sisters, our fellow Christians here at Victory, and help each other grow. And importantly, we need to trust the Holy Spirit working in us. In closing, I hope that you remember the following three key points. One, the story that Jesus told Nicodemus and tells us today, tells us every day, is that God loves us. This is a deep love, a broad love, and an eternal love. Number two, Jesus has invited us, he has invited you to come into the light for eternity. We only need to say, yes, Lord Jesus. Three, we need to know God's voice and we can recognize God's voice by reading the Bible, by worshiping, praying, studying, and spending time with other fellow Christians here at Victory or 
in other areas around the globe. And we need to trust the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your love. Send your Holy Spirit to help us to have a discerning heart and encourage us to say yes to the important work of telling your story, telling your love story. In your name we pray, amen.